There's a lot for me that was new out of this morning. So we're delighted that our first speaker after the coffee break is Becky Masco, who is from the James Lint Alliance, and she's a senior program manager at the National Institute for Health Research Evaluation Trials and Studies Coordinating Centre. Well, that is a bit of a mouthful, yeah, 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 trips up the tongue, in the University of Southampton. So you're very welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for having me here today. My name is, um, is Becky Maso, and I'm from the James Lind Alliance, and we're based at the University of Southampton in the UK. So the James Lind Alliance is uh, all about tackling treatment uncertainties together. I don't know how many of you here have ever, have ever heard of the James Lind Alliance before today. You have. Has anyone actually been involved in a priority setting partnership? Fantastic. I know Derek is, and Derek, apologies, I know you've heard me talk before. So, um, so the JLA is a non-profit uh, making initiative that brings together patients, carers and clinicians into priority setting partnerships. These partnerships identify and prioritise uncertainties or unanswered questions about the effects of treatment that they think are the most important. They focus on specific conditions or settings. Um, and the reason it exists is that research on the effects of treatments is usually led by researchers and uh, funders, and that can mean it can often fail to address the questions that really matter to the people that, that the research affects, and those people who are affected by the conditions. So uh, the aim is to agree by consensus a prioritised top ten list of research uncertainties in that particular area, to publicise the methods and the results, and to draw the results to the attention of research funders. So the aim is really about, I don't know if you can see that slide, bringing, um, ensuring that patients and clinicians help set the research agenda, giving them a bigger voice and making sure that the research is really re relevant. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that there is still a mismatch between what patients and health professionals want to see researched and what is actually getting researched. Um, here are some results from um, a piece of work that Sally Crow, who's been involved with the JLA um, since its inception, she, she did a piece of work to look at the priorities that have been identified um, by uh, former priority setting partnerships um, and compared with... Uh, the priorities of what is actually being researched and as you can see even today in 2015 there is still a mismatch of um, what patients and clinicians want to see researched so they're, they're focusing the importance on non-drug treatment research compared with most of the research that is actually being done into drug treatments and comparing drugs. So these findings really show that uh, the research community really needs to start thinking more about what's important to those users of research. Before I talk a bit more about the JLA, I just wanted to talk about um, the National Institute for Health Research because uh, the National Institute for Health Research, as you know, is perhaps one of the, um, at the forefront of PPI and um, it, it works to this framework. It's called the Adding Value in Research Framework that's about <coughs> maximising the potential impact of the research that it funds for patients and the public. And it means that it makes great strides in ensuring questions are relevant to the users of research, that um, it undertakes research that's appropriate in design, conduct and analysis. It's efficient in its regulation and delivery. It provides accessible full reports and that they're unbiased. And um, the JLA sits very firmly in the first pillar about ensuring that... Um, research addresses appropriate questions to the users. So the JLA was established in 2004 by uh, John Scadding, Serene <coughs> Chalmers and Cynic Partridge and they conceived it to, to provide this framework for identifying treatment uncertainties, how they could then be checked against the evidence and then prioritised. And uh, since the method was developed, the notion of treatment uncertainties has really broadened out now into a more general definition of interventions. Um, so there are a lot of PSPs in much broader treatments of care, um, things that make a difference to patients and that can be evaluated by research. Since 
April 2013, the JLA sits within the National Institute for Health Research, Evaluation, Trials, Studies and Coordinating Centre um, at uh, University of Southampton. So we're a very small team that runs the infrastructure of the James Lind Alliance. So we, um, we uh, employ and train seven JLA advisors who support the priority setting partnerships and we um, run the JLA website and do communications activity. And we help with the JLA advisors to develop the methodology and the guidebook. In case any of you don't know, there's James Lind. It's named after James Lind, who was um, the pioneer of clinical trials. It's actually his 300th birthday next week. So if you follow the JLA on Twitter, you can look out for some of the birthday celebrations. Uh, the JLA follows key principles um, in, in, in its priority setting method, that it's um, transparent in its activities and its methods. It's inclusive of, 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 of all groups. It ensures equality of participation um, of patients. So in, in PSPs, priority setting partnerships, patients are deemed equal experts in their knowledge and experience as, as our clinicians. It excludes those groups that normally do, um, do have a say in setting research priorities, um, which might be funders, researchers, and um, pharmaceutical industry. Um, and it ensures that all, all of the priorities are, are checked against the evidence. <coughs> so the process. Uh, the JLA is an adaptive <coughs> method. It adapts and it evolves in time, but there is, there's, there's, there's basic components of what happens. So the initial stage is about gathering the uncertainties. So it, um, usually by a survey or other methods, it goes out to the, to the stakeholder community and asks what unanswered questions do you have. All those are gathered in, um, and all those raw questions are categorised, refined, um, and checked against the evidence. That usually produces a very long list of research uncertainties that need to be narrowed down in order to, to undertake prioritisation. So normally, an interim prioritisation survey takes place. I can talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and it culminates in, in the final top ten um, at a workshop of priority setting. <coughs> Um, just a little bit more about the method. So um, the steering group uh, is set up in the particular condition that the priority setting partnership is going to take place. Um, and the steering group takes collective responsibility for delivering the priority setting partnership. They're supported by a JLA advisor. Um, there is, it, it's very important that there is an equal mix of patients, carers and clinicians in that um, steering group. And they're responsible for driving the PSP, for disseminating the survey, um, promoting it, and promoting the results. Uh, the, the JLA advisor acts as a neutral facilitator to ensure all voices are heard equally. The process of gathering uncertainties is usually via an online survey, but it really depends on the stakeholder community. There's a, there's a um, PSP about to take place in ageing and multimorbidity, and an online survey to a very ageing population may not be appropriate, so other methods of gathering unanswered questions from that community will have to be employed. Um, so the survey goes out to patients, clinicians, uh, carers, and it's usually a very open-ended questionnaire to allow it to be as accessible as possible to people. So it really is often things like, what questions do you have about your particular disease? Um, what comes in is very open-ended responses. People choose to share a lot of information about their experiences and their life. And it's, it's the trick of the information specialist and the steering group involved in the priority setting partnership to um, try and distill what's being said and, and, and to try and um, get what is the research question in that. Um, other ways of finding answer questions is through looking at research recommendations and other sources of data. Um, Go back to that one. So, uh, once the long list of questions have been developed, checked against the evidence, weeded out the questions that really are known unknowns, as it were. Um, normally, an interim prioritisation survey takes place, and that's usually online, and that's where um, stakeholders are asked to select their most important questions out of a long list of questions that have been identified. From that, um, uh, a short list of questions is developed that is taken to a final priority setting workshop. And the final priority setting workshop is a key part of the, 
of the JLA PSP process. And that's a day's exercise where around 30 participants come together and um, discuss and agree by consensus the 30 long list of questions, around 30, and to, to come up with the top 10. It's a really powerful day um, where uh, the groups are divided into small groups and they talk about, they bring their experiences and their views and values and they come together and share and, and discuss and, and um, come up with the top 10. There's just uh, some pictures of a final <coughs> priority setting workshop taking place. But just to say that because the, the PSP method is all about transparency, nothing is lost. All the questions are ultimately put on. The PSP usually creates its own website, and um, we put all the outputs of um, the PSP onto the JLA website. Apologies, I'm not sure you'll be able to read that, but these are some of the conditions that, uh, these are all the list of completed partnerships. There are now 40 completed <coughs> partnerships. Um, Maybe interest. There's uh, some uh, spinal cord injury. A PSP has been ta taken place in that. Um, all different ranges of conditions, and I think that just shows you the breadth. Um, some are more in um, settings. Some are in particular conditions. And these are the active ones. These are the uh, current partnerships that are taking place. Uh, some are very, very tightly focused. Others are uh, others are much broader in their scopes. Um, the James Lind Alliance REACH uh, is also international. Uh, recently, a PSP has completed in eating disorders in the Netherlands. That posed a number of challenges for us because it was in a different language. So um, for our JLA advisor to support them was, was challenging, um, but they succeeded. They managed very well. Luckily, a lot of people in the Netherlands speak very good English. Um, Canada has a, has a particular interest in the JLA and there's, there's a lot of um, PSPs taking place over there. And again, it's interesting because they, they are um, in a different place with their PPI and um, stakeholder involvement. And so we've had to think really carefully about how, how we put our methodology and, and, and share our methodology and ways of working with them. So the top 10, the, the prioritised list is at the end of the story for the JLA. Uh, the next step for the, for the PSP is to promote uh, the priorities to researchers, to, to pick up this research that's important, and, and to funders. So um, we encourage PSPs to uh, write publications, uh, speak at conferences, and there's just some examples of, of the sorts of... Um, dissemination activity that, take, that has taken place. Um, you may be interested that the uh, palliative and end-of-life care PSP that took place in the UK that was run by Marie Curie um, did a, a follow-on activity uh, in Ireland where they extracted the interim prioritisation results uh, that, that were um, submitted from Ireland, the, the island of Ireland, and they did a final priority setting workshop um, over here for island-specific <coughs> priorities. And you can see results of that on, on that website if you're interested. Successful PSPs are ones that really are prepared to do a lot of follow-up activ activity after uh, the PSP has completed. Sight Loss and Vision was a very large PSP, um, and they have a, on their website, it talks about one year on, two years on from the PSP, and what have they been doing. Um, and a lot of promotional activity means that they're more likely to actually get research that's funded. So... Um, this is the second clinical trial to tackle one of the questions that was identified in um, the Sight Loss and Vision PSP that was run by Fight for Sight. Um, as I said, we sit within the National Institute for Health Research who are also interested in um, what these priorities are because they have been identified by um, patients, carers and clinicians. So the NIHR uh, looks for topics for its commissioned work streams and will pick up uh, some of the questions that have been prioritised. Here's an example of, from the asthma PSP, although this one was actually uh, came through our researcher-led um, funding stream rather than our commissioned funding stream, but that's um, on the NIHR research pages of the website. And another one from uh, the schizophrenia PSP that um, has resulted in some commissioned research. That's actually a systematic review that was undertaken. So um, 
I think for us the challenge is about demonstrating the impact and the impact at for a PSP to, take, to to have real impact, it does ultimately want to translate into research, but that, that process can be a long time, so it does take a long time to translate. But there are, of course, other impacts, other benefits of a priority setting partnership. Um, and I just wanted to give you a quote from um, a participant in the mesothelioma priority setting partnership, which is... Um, uh, mesothelioma is a condition that is a result of asbestos, exposure to asbestos. And uh, she said, after my husband died, I wanted to use my experience of this dreadful disease to try and help shape future treatments and further research for mesothelioma patients. I found it extremely refreshing that patients, carers, health professionals and clinicians were all working together to identify the top research priorities. But it's not only patients, as I say, um, PSPs are about involvement of clinicians as well. And uh, Professor Keith Lloyd, who was involved in the schizophrenia PSP, uh, said... The week after the JLA workshop, a patient came to see me in a clinic and wanted a change of antipsychotic medication because of sexual dysfunction. Without the experience of the JLA process, it's unlikely that this issue would have afforded as much weight as it was. So it's just to illustrate that, that this collaborative working can really make a difference to, to practice. Um, that's really all I had to say. This is the JLA website. Please go and look at it. it. It's got on there, it's got the methodology, the guidebook. It lists all the different PSPs, um, the, the um, top tens from all of them, and the underlying questions as well from the top tens. Um, and uh, here's our Twitter address if you want to follow us on Twitter. And um, really, any questions? <laughs> We'll just have a couple of questions, Avril. Uh, again, just if you just introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, thank you. Thanks very much, Avril Kennan, for the invitation to the Ocean Gabba Island. And as you mentioned yourself, it can be a challenge to move from a PSP to actual practice and research. Have you any um, advice on the best things that you can do to make sure that it's reaching the research community and actually uh, having an effect on the research they're undertaking? That's a really, really good question, and that's what we're always striving. We're actually developing a, an impact page on our website, so watch this space, because it really is about having a dialogue, and, and, and I think having a really proactive steering group who are prepared to do that dissemination activity, to go out and talk at conferences, to, um, to write papers... To, to actively work harder, and those I think the successful PSPs are often ones that maybe have a charity behind them who can who can resource this because a lot of it is down to resources, and and some PSPs are done on a shoestring with uh, really enthusiastic people, but they just don't have the budgets to be following up, and, and the JLA doesn't have the resources, us as a don't have the resources to do all that promotional activity and follow up activity, so it's about trying to have I suppose the best. Um, <coughs> the best dissemination strategy it's really, it's really good at the start of your PSP to think about what your outputs are going to look like and who will, who will be receptive to those outputs and how you're going to promote them and if you can think about that right at the start before you embark on this adventure um, I think that's, that's probably the best strategy but how it works uh, luckily for us the NIHR <coughs> um, who is a key funder in the UK is very interested and cares about the JLA and wants to hear what the outputs are. So, I mean, that's that's a really positive thing in the UK, but um, it, it, it is a challenge. That's true. Thanks. Just time for one more question. Again, Hi, um, Alexis Donnelly, um, Trinity <coughs> College Dublin, and um, familiar with MS as well. Um, have you done any of these PSPs uh, a second time around? And um, how do you measure uh, the impact on research? The number of new topics introduced in appearing in papers and journals, um, feedback from patients, um, and have you got the ear of parliament or government? <laughs> really, really, that's, that's, that's a really right. difficult question, <laughs> but thank you. Yeah, I think it's an easy question. But um, <laughs> you're absolutely right in that PSPs are a snapshot in time and so it's, it's very valid that a, a PSP could take place in the same condition 
some time on and you may get a different top 10, you may get a different set of outcomes. There is actually um, a PSP taking place in Canada on dementia and a, and a PSP in dementia took place, I can't remember how many years ago, quite a few years ago, so there will be a repeat, in but it's in a, different, in a different country. And it will be interesting to see what the outcomes are. But as yet, in the UK, there hasn't been a repeat exercise. Um, in terms of measuring impact, really difficult. And as I say, we're, we're looking at different ways, because what, what, you, know, you, can, you can debate what impact means. We follow very carefully what the NIHR translates into calls for research. Sometimes they put out calls, but don't get any applicants for, or... Um, Sometimes they're not within the remit of what they can fund. So it's not just for the NIHR to fund this research, it's for anyone to fund the research. Um, do we have the ear of government? Uh, the NIHR is, is part of, it's, it's the research wing of the NHS, so um, I suppose it's for government. Government funds NIHR research, so um, in that sense, it does. Um, again, successful PSPs are the ones that do try and promote, um, say, Fight for Sight had their sight loss and vision. Um, they had, a, 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 I think, a, um, an event at the House of Commons, the House of Lords. So they do try and promote the activity, but it's not really for the JLA. We don't have the resources to do that promotional activity. It's for the PSP themselves to do that. I'll just say thanks to Maria McGee. Just as an addendum and somebody who's interested.